You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. Hi, I'm Monica Giacca of Owl Paper Goods, and I make rubber stamps for a living. Monica Giacca is a Toronto-based artist and the owner and designer behind Owl Paper Goods. After making her first stamp as a gift for a friend's wedding, she went on to hone her craft in rubber stamp design, specializing in portraiture. Here's my chat with Monica Giacca. Who are you and what do you make for a living? I am Monica Giacca. I own Owl Paper Goods and I make rubber stamps of people's faces. I'm showing you it, what it looks like right now, <laughs> but basically it's uh, characters of people's faces and it's carved into rubber stamps and you can use it for whatever you like, uh, invitations, thank you cards, um, or just to have it because you like to look at your own face. How in the world did you get started doing this? Uh, you know, I had seen someone else do it. I saw, I think maybe a Pinterest post or something. And it kind of harkened back to my grade nine art class where we learned how to do rubber carving. And I was thinking, you know what, I'd probably do something like that. I had a friend of mine who was getting married. So I made one for her. It turned out okay. When I look at it now, I'm like, oh my God, this is garbage. I need to do another one for her. But um, yeah, and I, I made that one and I thought it turned out pretty good. So I thought I'd try another couple. I, I had previously owned an Etsy page that I didn't sell anything on, so I loaded it up there, and I got a sale within the first two days. So it was pretty exciting. I, I, I guess I found like this little niche, tiny niche market that uh, not too many people are doing right now. That's what I keep hearing over and over again: is find a niche, find a niche, and then and then you'd be surprised how many people really want that product, want that thing. I mean, is that what you found? Yeah, I mean, my first Etsy shop was making jewelry, so you can imagine the competition in that market, and my jewelry was subpar. So. Um, I wasn't surprised that I didn't make any sales, but I was a little disheartened and maybe I thought it was the platform, although I, you know, I did know it was my own work in the end. Um, and in finding this little niche, yeah, like it's, it's really the way to use that site. And then of course, branch off into your own thing, but it's a great way to get known if, if, if you can figure out what hasn't been tapped into yet. You started off and it was, let's say a little less than perfect. How did you get better at it? How did you hone this craft? Practice, practice, practice. I, you know, I, I look back on my old drawings even from a year ago, two years ago, and I can see the evolution of my work. So it's just practicing, finding new ways to pull out people's character features that make them unique. Um, and and then just my skill is getting better. My, I found new tools, those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a time and progression and lots of hard work. How are you starting? Like, how are you making these things? Are you starting with a picture or are you just, are you looking at, at a friend or you're looking at a person and they sit for you and you do a... God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that talented. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I even see like the character artists at, you know, Canada's Wonderland, like drawing people and I'm like, wow, that's talent. I could never do that. <laughs> Although ultimately my work ends up being the same. So actually what I'm doing is pulling up people's images on my iPad uh, actually, it's a Samsung. Um, and then I, I take down a piece of tracing paper and I trace out their features exactly. So when people tell me like, oh, like my face isn't exactly that wide. I'm like, oh, it kind of is in that picture. Um, yeah. So I just I trace it out on the on the paper and the um, the pencil that's left behind on the paper actually makes an exact like perfect pressing onto the rubber. So I just need to kind of rub it on and peel it off and then it's on the rubber. And from there, I just carve out all the negative space. So that's more skill than artistry. It's just a little practice to get the right depths and things, but. And, and so are they, are they coming out the size of the size of a coffee cup? So we're looking at something that would probably feel like a five by seven or like an Instagram shot, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How did you take this from being something that, you, that was a gift for somebody and, and how did you take it pro? Did you have a big break? Did you sell a bunch of stuff? What happened? Well, I mean, I kind of went into it with realistic expectations. I was thinking, I have a full-time job, and I, and I still do. I have, well, I guess I'm technically part-time there, full-time here now. So I had a full-time job at the time, and I knew that this was only going to be part-time for now. Um, so my evenings were completely dedicated to it when I wasn't at work. Um, I started product by product, loading them in. I did a lot of research online about how to make your Etsy shop successful. So getting in at least 70 listings, making your SEO um, very specific, giving the descriptions, bright photography. And I mean, I wish, I wish I had old photos of what my photos originally looked like. They were horrible. They were dark. I was taking them at night. 
Um, I didn't really have a brand yet, so my colors were kind of all over the place. My descriptions were kind of descriptive, but not all the details. Um, so kind of building those things up slowly. And then as that progressed, other things start to become more important. So it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a pyramid. You start with your foundation, then that you're building your way up. You're like, oh, I need to build out more to support myself as I go up. So then you start the finance element of it. And, oh, I need to open up a new bank account and I need to get my own website now. So I, I honestly don't think I could be where I am right now if I tried to build it overnight or even in a week. Um, it's, it's taken five years to get here and I'm sure it'll take another five years to get where I'm going to be in the future. Everybody tells you about, about these thousand things you have to set up initially uh, before mm -hmm. you can even consider getting out there or, or selling something or whatever else. And it seems you know, pretty daunting and pretty endless when really you hear, you, you speak to any actual maker or somebody who's actually doing something and they just tell you, I just started. Exactly. I started and I figured stuff out and I started bolstering the foundation to use your metaphor. You know, I started building it out as I went, as was needed. Exactly. And I didn't have to know everything out of the gate. Yeah. I think all of those thousand things are needed when you're at the place of success of being where you want to be and you need to maintain all those things all at once. But if you're just starting out, it's really just about the baby steps. Get your product started, make sure it's good, have some key elements like good photography, good SEO, um, you know, uh, uh, figure out your shipping, like all the basic, like the fundamentals of your business and then build out from there and, and you'll get where you want to be eventually. And if you can do your, your, your making full time, you'll get there a lot faster than I did. Um, it's all about how much time you can allot to something every, every day or night. What's your creative process? You told me you're, you're starting with a photo mm -hmm. on, on a, on a tablet. Is there something about, I think you said it was a Samsung, but like, is there something about that one that makes it particularly good for this? It is a Samsung tab S I don't know, four or five. I, I can't remember the, the generation. Give us a call sponsors. Anyway, go on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what it, what I like about it is that it has the pen. So if you have an Apple tablet that has the Apple pen, like that's actually really great. And in, in fact, perhaps I wish I'd gone that route because you can use Procreate on there and this doesn't have a Procreate equivalent, but, um, the pen has allowed me to do a lot of digital artwork. So instead of carving a stamp, I could do an illustration for somebody. Uh, and I make made the switch eventually to an Apple. I don't, I think my business is dependent on it being Samsung. But <laughs> Where do you actually get uh, rubber for your stamps? All the supplies I use, I get from my local store, Madoko, just down the street. Michael sells it as well to Sarah's. So it's the speedy cut rubber. It's the carving tools, the tracing paper. I mean, the startup costs. I hope I'm not encouraging people to do the same thing. But you better not <laughs> come after my business here. <laughs> um, no, I, the startup costs are pretty low for this. Like, with thirty dollars, you can start doing the this this craft, which is makes it very accessible. You know, it's not like glass blowing or clay making or something like that. It's nice to know that there's things that you can do in an apartment that you can do with the tools yeah. that are nearby that are available in pretty much any town, and 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 make something of it. I mean, chances are nobody's going to make the same two things. I don't think there's any yes. real concern. Just because I now know the recipe for how to make rubber stamps, I, I can assure you I'm not going to make them. My tracing skills are garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I've been teaching carving classes, and um, I, I've I figured out about 30 people now, and I can see people's skills growing, and, and I can see where they're going with it, but people tend to be more interested in carving flowers and happy faces and those sorts of things, so no competition just yet. <laughs> Tell me about where you find inspiration. I mean, is, is it mostly something that, you know, when somebody gives you a call, because th these are custom, right? Or do you make ones that are sort of generically available as well? Yeah, about 80% of what I sell is custom. So it's either solo or couple portraits, or sometimes it's people's pets. So the inspiration comes directly from the individual. They give me their photo. Um, but I do have some kind of standalone pre-carved stamps. So I've got ones of flowers and bees. Um, I've got simple phrases like thank you. Uh, my my pre-cut stamps are pretty much um, designed to, around the wedding market. I find that most people who are buying my stamps are for weddings. So I try to make it things that you might put on a save the date card, those sorts of things. So in terms of inspiration, it may be a stamp I've seen another stamp carver do, and I'll just do my own version of it. I obviously don't want to copy somebody else's outright and get called out for something. That would be horrible. Um, but yeah, if I see something, I mean, I'm not, I'm not encouraging plagiarism, but I do think it's 
find to get ideas from other people and say, well, it's been really successful for them. How could I do my own spin on it and, and be able to capitalize on that? All of the great artists and all of the supposedly most original people out there throughout history, you know, they all copy from others. They all borrow. And it's an homage. They're not, they're not lying about that. I always say this to people when in, in television, someone says, oh, you know, uh, I've got a, a cooking show idea, but there's already so many uh, cooking shows. I was like, yeah, but if they didn't need more cooking shows, there wouldn't be a cooking network. Exactly. So, exactly. What about boredom? What about creative block? What about doubting what you're doing? Did you, have you ever encountered these kinds of issues? And, you know, how do, how do you stay motivated in the face of them? One thing I've always been really nervous about. So, like I mentioned earlier, I'm making this transition where this is now becoming my full-time job. I really enjoy what I'm doing. And I've become increasingly nervous that I am going to resent doing it. Um, I haven't quite gotten to that point, but I do get burnt out. Like August, in August, I get like just an insane amount of wedding orders, usually people making thank you cards. Um, and I, I love it. I look forward to it. But at the end of August, I am so tired of making stamps. I don't even want to look at rubber anymore. I have to like take a vacation. You know, I, I went, um, went on a holiday in November and when we got back, I didn't want to touch anything for like two months and I didn't. Uh, it was nice. It was a nice recharge, but it kind of like freaked me out a little bit. So I need to start kind of reevaluating how much of myself I'm putting into my work and how I can maybe automate some of my processes. So at this point, I haven't figured that out because everything is completely hand-drawn, hand-carved. But uh, I did actually right behind me. You can see that I've got this laser printer. Uh, that, when I figure out how to use it, is going to helpfully <laughs> help me out there. <laughs> how do you envision that helping you out? It can cut rubber, actually, exactly how I carve stamps. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've done a couple of test cuts. It's, I just need to figure out how to ventilate it properly so that my neighbors in my apartment aren't bothered by the smell. So at this time, I've not figured that out. <laughs> Proper ventilation is always good, everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Always ventilate. You kind of hit on something that I'm, that I'm always curious about when I talk to, uh, to artists and to makers, this idea of balancing off your creative, your, your business, and your, and your personal life. What do you think you can do to you know, sort of mitigate that, that kind of burnout and to have a, a better balance? Yeah, um, during the busier seasons, I extend my processing time. So instead of my standard three to five days, I might make it five to 10 days. I don't want to scare people away, but it allows me a little, like I can take a day off in there, even if I've got back, orders backing up. Um, but I also structure my day. So I do still work at my day job in the morning, and I do that until 4 p.m. And I come home, I have a three-year-old daughter, so I have to give her time as well. We'll play until 9 p.m. when she goes to bed. And then I work on this business from 9 to midnight. Uh, it's a long day. But to be honest, I don't see it right now as work because I listen to podcasts and I educate myself while I'm carving stamps because it's kind of a little bit mindless work where I can watch a movie or something while I'm doing it. I find that structure helps me kind of divide up my day. So I'm not worried about my personal business while I'm at my, my employer's place of work. I'm not worried about it when I'm with my daughter. I could play with her. And if I need to go out and enjoy some time with a friend, book a babysitter and my husband and I will go out and we'll enjoy ourselves because I know I've set up the processing time that I can, I can promise to my clients. Stress of coming through for your clients and delivering for your clients is, is one of those things that allows it to seep into the, these, these different parts of your life. And yeah. uh, I think a lot of people run into that, even if they're not makers, you know, folks are at work and they're worried about what's going on at home. People are at home and they're worried about what's going on at work. Having that kind of good separation and, and blocking off time can be really helpful. Do you find that, um, that the kind of stuff you're making, because it has, as you're saying that there's a certain, uh, you know, I'll use your word, but you said a bit of a mindless process to some of it, which not all, not all people kind of, who not all makers get to kind of shut off their brain a little bit while they're doing this right. stuff. If you're doing woodworking, you want your brain on. Yeah, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to be running a bandsaw. So is partially that work, it, it kind of is downtime for you a little bit. It is. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's meditation, but it's, um, it's certainly relaxing. I actually haven't gotten into ebooks yet, like, you know, audio books, but I probably should get into that because I've got the time to listen to them. But um, man, I've got like 25 podcasts I listen to pretty regularly. I keep up with the news and I've watched like every movie that comes through Netflix. So I can do all those things without feeling lazy because I'm actually being very productive while I'm doing them. I do look forward to my carving time and my weekends, which are pretty much 
completely devoted to carving right now. So, so your husband takes you takes your three year old for uh, for most of the weekends then while you're in crazy carving mode. My husband works back to back like shift work on the weekend, my weekends, and also is in school. So I actually have my daughter full time on the weekends. I just set her up with crafts. I was gonna say, does she carve with you? Yeah, <laughs> she'll sit here. I buy her like all of these little crafts, so she's doing art stuff with me. So it's nice we get to work together. Hopefully when she's a little bit older, we can carve together, but they're sharp tools. So maybe when she's like six. Right. Exactly. Let's wait a little bit before she's wielding exactly. exacto knives and whatnot. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your, the business side of things then, because if you're, if you're carving and creating at night, nine until midnight, obviously that's, those are business hours. Those aren't when you might be shipping things or, or, or marketing or whatever. How, how does that kind of run for you? So on my weekends, which are Sunday and Mondays, I do like I said, a lot of work. I do all of my Instagram photography on those days because I'm working during the day when I have like these big windows and I can take pictures in full sunlight. And those I set up for during the week because I can't take pictures anytime during the week and get the proper lighting. I mean, I guess I could purchase another product and get like, you know, one of those light boxes. I just don't have the space for it in my apartment anymore. So, um, so I do that. I do take messages while I'm at work. I'm fortunate enough to work at a job that's at a computer, so I can open up my Etsy page and answer people's messages there. So I'm happy to do that as long as I have the time at work. Um, and I, I mean, I know I said I'm carving all night, but I do also do all my finances for my business at night too. So I've got my little Excel spreadsheet, which I probably should start porting into a more um, accountant friendly program, but for now it's an Excel and I load everything in there, all of my receipts every month, I total everything up and reconcile it. Um, and that just kind of slots into the month as, as needed. At some point, would you consider bringing on partner or outsourcing certain things? Yeah. Um, I've come to realize that like finance is not really my strong suit. I think a lot of creative people might agree with me on that. Um, so I would like to get a bookkeeper at some point to kind of just take over that part. I also find like taxes to be very intimidating and always a struggle. I have a friend who uh, helped me out with my taxes last year and did that whole business part of it for me. So I'm hoping this year I can remember how to do it myself. But essentially, yes, I do want to hire someone for that. I have, I was kind of hoping and teaching um, rubber carving that I might be able to find somebody who could carve with me. But I'm just realizing that I've, you know, I've chalked up like 5,000 hours doing this and I'm just way more advanced. I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's just, I can't have a new person coming in and carving my stamps. So that's what the machine is for. That will be my next employee. Nice. And, <laughs> and then I have, I have looked into hiring um, someone to come and do some marketing and advertising for me. So uh, I'll probably be doing that in the spring for like the spring wedding season. Like what, what sort of advertising, what sort of marketing would you do? I'm assuming primarily online. Yeah. But like what's, what platforms are the best for you? Um, so Etsy has marketing that they, well, now they're going to be forcing you to enroll into it. So once you have hit a $10,000 sales mark, you're required to use their marketing platform. That's fine. I'm happy to do it. They've brought me so much business. Um, I also advertise on Facebook and on Instagram. And sneaky, I also joined every single marketing Facebook buy and sell across Canada. And I advertise in those for free. I just like post it up and people will message me. So every couple of months I'll go and do like a wash of those, take some time, but it does have a really big return. A lot of folks are, are spending a lot of time just posting only on their channels and they're not really considering spending a few bucks on promoting a post or getting something a little more visible. Mm -hmm. And they're certainly not looking really into some of the different markets and pages in a way that could be really beneficial to them. Yeah. You know, obviously you don't want to go spamming a bunch of places, but there's, there's a page for almost everything, whether it's on Facebook or, on, you know, so you want to make sure you take advantage of those kinds of things. Oh yeah. What about pricing? How do you decide what to charge? Cause you're, you're, you sort of have a, an, an interesting product because you do so much custom work. Mm -hmm. Are you selling a service or are you selling a product? And how are you kind of pricing that out? Yeah, it's kind of a little bit of both, isn't it? Because, yeah, it is, it's both a service and a product. Um, I, pricing is it's hard. Any creative who sells their work will tell you it's, like, impossible to figure out how to price it because you need to cover your costs, you need to cover your own fees, uh, you need to make a profit on it in the end. Um, it was a bit of math and calculation to figure it out. It was also comparing similar work online to see what people were pricing theirs at. Um, I started at about $50 per person, 
which I found was good because my my actual supplies only cost me about a dollar or two. But it's like the time because it's not just it's not just done in an hour. This takes several days. I have to make the draft, which is you know, maybe 20 minutes or so. I send it out. I have to maybe wait a day or two for someone to get back to me. Oftentimes they have edits. I have to edit it, send it out. And I do unlimited edits. I've done up to 25 edits for a person before. So I'm happy to do it. It's for a wedding and it needs to be perfect. Um, and then when they get back to me and they're finished with it, I then have to still carve the stamp. So I feel like a, you know, 90% return or sorry, a uh, profit on it is, it's pretty good after all of my expenses of shipping and those sorts of things. Um, that said, I know not everybody can do that with their product, but finding that like sweet spot where you're still making enough money, but it's still, um, reachable for your client to afford. Yeah. You want to make sure you can still sell. Exactly. You know, I mean, obviously listen, there's, there's, there's some folks out there that are fortunate enough that they can splash a little paint around and sell it for millions of dollars. And obviously oh, yeah. that's few yep. and far between <laughs> the rest of us make stuff for real people who really want the piece who really want yeah. that, that item. And, uh, it, it, yeah, somehow you got to find that balance between making your money and at the same time, uh, making it attainable, making it obtainable. Exactly. So what advice would you give to somebody who was looking to get into, I mean, making in general, but like, you know, into, into the stamp game, the rubber game, <laughs> is that a game? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. We're, yeah. The stamp, stamp hustler. The stamp game. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I guess I would say find, yeah, obviously find your niche, find the thing that you can do that's special, different. Um, when I first started, there was a maker, she's out in Japan, her name, her shop name is Talk to the Sun. And if you're really interested in like illustrational um, stamps, she's great. So she was really who I based my whole shop off of. Um, I had to be very careful not to like copy her because I was just so obsessed with how she took her pictures and like the kinds of stamps she made. In the end, if you look at my shop and hers were completely different. But when I first started out, I found someone I looked up to and modeled myself after their business. So how do they answer shipping times and how are their prices and what were their returns and refunds um, like? So I could kind of build up on that. So I would recommend finding somebody that you looked up to as a business owner and mimicking your business off of theirs because they're obviously doing something right. A lot of folks simply don't have folks around. It's often a solitary endeavor and it's, it's something that they're driven to do and that they don't always have people with them doing it. Yeah. So it's always nice to, in today's day and age, to be able to actually find mentorship, even if that person isn't entirely certain they're mentoring you at the time. Though the other nice thing is you can actually reach out to them often and, and introduce yourself and say hi and say, here's what I'm trying to do and I'm really impressed with what you're doing. Do you want to share a little bit of info with me? Exactly. Yeah, you know, I hear a lot of folks um, getting a lot of valuable information and, and starting up nice uh, friendships and, and back and forth with people. Well, that's the thing with the maker community. Like People are generally very generous with their time and very, very friendly. Uh, for example, I'm doing the one of a kind show this month. I've never done it. I'm terrified. I'm, I'm very excited, but I, I feel like I'm jumping in feet first into something I have no idea about. Um, but everyone has been so friendly. So I have all these people in my area. I've contacted them all and I've asked them how they prepared for the show. Um, and, and I've gotten so many tips and people have given so much of their time to me for free. And I think as long as you're not com contacting your direct competitor and saying like, what supplies do you use? How do you get to your pricing? Like that, obviously they might not give to you, but even if you contact another maker who deals in a different medium, they might be able to give you advice as to how to build the foundation of your business. Right. Because those markets are a very particular type of endeavor. I mean, yes, there, you know, you can go there and set up a, a booth and sell a couple of things and think you've done okay, or you can go there and there's ways to work them. There's ways oh, yeah. to make yeah. them really useful to you. It doesn't always work, but there's certainly things that you can do to to try and get the most out of setting up shop because it's a, it's a big commitment to go to one of them. Oh, yeah. It's a big financial commitment too. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. But the nice thing is, is you get so much nice exposure. You get lots of people walking by, a lot of uh, mm. f literal foot traffic that you wouldn't have being an online business generally and stuff like that. And, and I think for a lot of uh, uh, consumers, they're there to buy. Yeah. You know, they're, they're there to meet the artists and the artisans. And so that's kind of one of those nice things that it's actually an opportunity to kind of meet these people that kind of only exist in product form online for most, right. for most of the year. So that's always a nice thing, I think, for, you know, both groups to find, uh, to find each other a little bit and sort of put a name with yeah. a face as it were. And actually in terms of you were asking about advertising, doing markets and shows is a great way to get your product out there, especially if you can throw out your 
you know, um, your mailing list subscription, get people to sign up there, throw in a follow me on Instagram contest or something to gain followers so that they can continue to follow you after they've left the show. People will remember you. They'll come back hopefully the next year to find you again. I know I've done that many times at craft shows like, oh God, I hope that maker is still there because I really want to buy that necklace I saw or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, great way because the, the number of people coming by your little booth is out in the thousands, especially at a show like the one of a kind show. Right. Um, and you can definitely, hopefully <laughs> get a lot of future business from there. So where can people find you on the web and social? Yeah. Um, so I have a website, www.owlpapergoods.com. Um, likewise for Etsy, if you prefer to shop on there, it's etsy.com slash owlpapergoods. And, uh, just as creatively on Instagram at Owl Paper Goods. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing with us how you make a living. Thank you for having me. Subscribe to Making a Living Show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. Making a Living Show is brought to you by me. But if you'd like it to be brought to you by you, then become a patron of the program at makingalivingshow.com. There's a button there that will take your money and give it to me. You can find me at robylevy.com. Thanks for listening.